My plan this morning is to talk about two things, and uh, they're, they're quite different, and yet, of course, they're related. Um, the first thing would be more devotional. I want to talk to you about what God's been doing in my life just in, over the last year. And uh, secondly, I would like to talk to you about the testimony booklet that uh, a, a lot of uh, thought and prayer has been going into, and I've been asking for input from a lot of you um, as we've put it together, and um, talk to you about a uh, um, maybe something that we can learn about strategy uh, in witnessing. So uh, that's the, the place I'm going to go. When I start talking to you about what has happened in my life in the last year, um, I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I might have some Glenn Beck moments. <laughs> um, it's been a very emotional year for me spiritually. And uh, so if I get emotional, just don't worry about it. Just go with it. Um, it's just a sign that God's working in my life, I think. Um, I'm way past, way past worrying about it. Um, over this, this year, I have, I have wept buckets of tears. And uh, so if you see that, I'm just not going to be embarrassed about it. Sorry. Uh, I've been a believer for 38 years. Uh, 38 years ago, I knelt down in my apartment in Provo at BYU in response to Romans chapter 10, where it says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, whoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. And I didn't have Billy Graham there to help me out to explain it all to me. I just was responding to what God was saying in the, in the word. And from that moment, my life's never been the same. And it's been an awesome adventure ever since. And those 38 years have just been amazing what God has done. Uh, and uh, how he surprises me again and again and again. You just never quite know what's coming next when you uh, serve the Most High. Um, and this year was another example of that where I, uh, I got surprised. Um, one, one year ago, I was able to share with you, um, and uh, Aaron put this on YouTube, and within a few weeks, I started getting bombarded with emails, not from Christians who were wanting to get trained, but from Mormons who wanted to know what we were doing, what we were up to. And uh, they had gone online and to, to find the, the YouTube um, of the training, and I'm, I'm assuming they did it with others as well. And uh, so I had Mormons that I had some dialogues with uh, as a result of it. So I'm sure that'll happen again, and there will be Mormons that will... Uh, We'll see this training, even though it's really directed to you, to my Christian brothers and sisters, my fellow missionaries, co-workers in the gospel. Um, you know, through my uh, first 37 years as a believer, I, I think there were a lot of things that you probably can relate to. Um, I, I came to an understanding of doctrine. I, I studied my Bible. I'd have quiet times in prayer and and I'd learn and grow as I'd hear sermons, and um, uh, things would, would change my life, as, and I would grow in that. And I think we, we all, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time at all, you have uh, experienced that, how God, how God works through different people, other believers, through pastors who preach awesome sermons, maybe even a sermon on the radio or a devotional book, and all these things, they were like threads that God was bringing into my life with nuggets of truth. You know, I've got six grandkids now. I, I love being a grandpa. Uh, they're all very young. And uh, I have been watching them, and I see things that I saw in my own children that I had kind of forgotten about. And one of them is this, this uh, fact that children remember things, and they learn things that you don't think they're learning. You can, you can uh, give them a little explanation, and you think they're just off here somewhere, and then some... Months later, they'll come back and they'll parrot it back to you so you realize that they really did learn it. And I've come to realize, you know, I'm that way too. God brings things into my life, sermons and whatnot, and, and I, I hear them and I, and I get it. You know, it's not that I don't get it. It's just that I, I don't completely put it all together. And all these little th colored threads are, are woven in there. And then every once in a while, God lets me step back. And it's like, whoa, look at that tapestry. 
It's amazing, God, what you're doing in my life. Um, one of the things that God did was to have me uh, uh, watch the Truth Project video series. How many of you have seen that? Truth Project? It is excellent. I highly recommend it. Um, it was uh, produced, I guess, by Focus on the Family. The, uh, the man who does the teaching in it is Del Tackett. It's a series of about, uh, what I think it's 12 videos. And, um, oh, you know, I should tell you right off, I have minor asthma and it's been flaring up lately, so if I go into a coughing fit, just, um, you can edit that out of the video. <laughs> I watched The Truth Project and was very, very uh, touched by it, but um, it, it really brought to mind some other things that I learned through the course of my, my Christian walk. and, and would, I could pull it together a little bit. For example, I learned right off the bat when I became a Christian that God is so much bigger than I ever imagined as a Mormon. Mormons have this very limited um, description of their gods. And uh, there's always some, some limit. But when I, when I came to realize who he really is, he is so awesome and so amazing. You know, we kind of focus sometimes on the Trinity versus um, the Mormon concept of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit being separate gods. But I think more profound than that is, is how big God is. Uh, he is just amazing. And, and in the Truth Project, they talk about something that, that really helped me to, to uh, uh, picture it, I guess. It's the imagery that helped and he was talking about um, the cosmos. He played a clip from, um, oh, what's that famous atheist, uh, Carl Sagan. And uh, he talked about the cosmos are all that ever has been, all that are, and all that ever will be. And uh, of course, he was saying that to make his case. Well, Del Tackett brought that up. He says, is that true? Well, no, it's not true because there is a God. He's saying there's no God. But what about the cosmos? He says virtually, all the world, all people in all religions have this idea of the cosmos. Everything that exists, matter, energy, time, and space, and if they're uh, into some metaphysical thing, they'll add a metaphysical component, but all these components make up the cosmos. And you can think of the cosmos in a cube. And uh, so you've got this cosmic cube and if you put any religion, any religious system into it, you basically have deities that rise up within the cube and some of them are more exalted than others. And of course, Mormonism does that exactly. All their gods are inside the cosmic cube and they, they try and exalt themselves and become gods and the theology is that we can do the same thing. Um, but he said, Christianity is different because the Bible says that God created not just the earth, he created the heavens. God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning. God is outside the box. He is so much bigger than the box, than the cosmic cube. And he holds it in the palm of his hand. He spoke it into existence. Sometimes we talk about heaven, we have this image, maybe it's kind of like the Mormon's concept of heaven somewhere near Kolob or something, on some planet, all within the cosmic cube. Heaven's not small. Heaven is where God is while he's standing there holding the cosmic cube. <laughs> that's how big heaven is. It's an awesome place because that's the dwelling place of God. But the thing about the verse that says that, that God uh, created the heavens, is that it tells us something about where he was. He was outside them. He was outside the cosmos. He's not within them. He enters within them, of course. He entered in the, in the, the person of Jesus Christ and intervenes in the cosmic, cosmic cube, but he's so much greater and more wonderful and awesome than the cosmic cube. Well, that really stuck with me. Another thing that Del Tackett talked about in, in the Truth Project is, uh, a, uh, well, oh, was, was the idea of cocoons. He said that in his life he had gone through many cocoons. The idea of a caterpillar um, weaving a cocoon and being enclosed in it, very uncomfortable position, and you're all closed off from everything else. And then after some period of time, then the caterpillar bursts forth into a beautiful butterfly. 
And he, he was explaining how in his own life that had happened with him, that there were different points in his life where he'd gone into these cocoons and come out. And uh, I want to, want to basically share with you today about a cocoon that I went into and came out on the other side uh, with, with an amazing transformation in my own heart. Um, part of the Truth Project also was to raise a question. Del Tackett called it the, the haunting question. I can get this to work. Is it advancing? <laughs> Starting to think Max are sounding better and better. <laughs> Okay, maybe we just have to use the buttons. So. Okay. There's the haunting question that he raised there. In, in, this, in this series, he's, he's the instructor in a classroom setting, and so he's got a classroom full of people, and he's, he's posing these questions and showing them uh, PowerPoints and videos and whatnot as he goes through the, through the class. But this is a question he raises. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? For 37 years, I had lots of doctrines that I believed and learned about. I taught them. I was a Bible teacher, taught many classes. I knew my stuff, right? But this is a great question. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Do you live your life that way? Del Tackett said, you know, he, it haunts him because he said that when you think about going into the presence of God and how difficult sometimes it is for us to do that. We, we you know, kind of resist it. We finally get into the presence of God and we pray. And uh, he said, if, if I really believed that what I believe is really real, I would never want to leave. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And that really hit me. And I began to realize what was happening to me in that that uh, my Christian walk had been wonderful, but there'd been lots of highs and lows. And, and you can relate to this, I'm sure. You have those moments when maybe you're, you're uh, hearing an awesome sermon or you're having a wonderful worship time and you're on this high and you really feel like you're in the presence of God and it's a great blessing. Maybe it's on a retreat or something like that. And then you have these lows, these valleys where you just can't really sense God at all. You, you're not really thinking about him. You're just kind of busy with your life. And then something wakes you up and you say, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. And then you, you turn back to, to God for a while and, you, and then you have another high. And, and, and our walk with God tends to be a lot of ups and downs. Um, is there anybody here that can relate to that? Or will, am I the only one that, okay, good. Uh, and it's not that I wasn't a believer or I didn't know that I was saved by grace and all that, but when you add to that the fact that during this last year, um, I, I've had a business failure. Basically, my wife and I lost everything. And I, I was in this valley, like, continuously. And I had to face the fact, oh, and then my marriage was struggling, be partly because of that, but partly because of just everything else. My, I, I had to face the fact that, that I had to take responsibility. It wasn't just that the economy did this to me. It's my own sin, my own failures that have put me in this position and I just feeling far from God, feeling dry. Yeah, all the doctrines there, I know I'm saved by grace, but man, it's just, oh man, it was such a low. And my wife and I really had some hard times uh, in our marriage. Um, praise the Lord, we have come out of that <laughs> just like the butterfly. It's just been awesome. But going through it wasn't any fun. It wasn't any fun at all. Um, but I, th I started thinking about what is it that keeps me from being with God? Well, there's really two things. One is doubts and one is sin. Now, doubts I had, I had mostly dealt with. I've actually taught classes about evolution. You know, early in my Christian life, I, I would have doubts. I was a, an, a theistic evolutionist. I tried to say, well, God created, but he did it with evolution. I think there's a lot of Christians that do that. I didn't want to look stupid. And so doubts would be a part of the problem. But to be honest with you, doubts really are not part of the problem anymore. Um, my doubts are pretty much gone. I believe that the God of the universe is the God who is outside the box, 
who spoke everything into existence. And as I look around and I see everything that he made, uh, I can see that, that amazing God. But sin, that's different. Now, sin is something that's always there. It, it always was. That was a thing that God dealt with on the cross when I got saved. But sin always begins in here. Sin's in the mind. And I, I, as I was reflecting on sermons, looking at scriptures, things that I had even taught, I thought about the fact that we're supposed to be renewed. Our minds are supposed to be renewed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I started to realize how many verses there are that talk about the mind. And sin is in there. You know, and the, there's the old man and the new man. Now, do you remember the, the, the passage in, in Romans 7 and the struggle between the fleshly man and the spiritual man and how I, I want to do what God uh, wants. I want to honor him. I want to please him. But the old man still likes sin and there's this battle. And Paul, toward the end of the chapter, Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of death, this body of death? I have always believed that that was just a part of the Christian life. It's just the Christian struggle. You know, you have this, this battle going on between the old man and the new man. When we get our, our new bodies, we'll be like Christ, and that, that will solve that problem. But right now, it's just the battle that we face as Christians. And, uh, and so, but sin is, is the thing, sin in the mind in, in, in particular, is the thing that keeps us out of the presence of God. We want what we want whatever kind of sin it is. And, and, it, and God can't be where sin is. And the Mormons are right in the statement um, that uh, uh, what God doesn't look upon sin with the least degree of allowance and no unclean thing can dwell with him. The Bible says it differently. You know, he's of pure eyes than to behold evil. Uh, that's one of those few places I can agree with Mormons about. God is holy and he can't have sin in his presence. So the highs and, and, the, and the lows tend to correspond to where my mind's at is, is what tended to happen. And I don't want that. And now I'm in this pit of despair because of the economy and what's happened to my business and my marriage and everything else. And I was just crying out to God because I wanted to be with him. And I realized I need to be in the presence of God and I need to deal with it. Now in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about a thorn in the flesh and he says that three times he prayed for that thorn in the flesh to be removed. And the answer that came to him was, my grace is sufficient for you. And we remember that, but there's another part to the answer that God gave Paul. He said, in, uh, my strength is demonstrated in your weakness. Now I don't know exactly what the thorn in the flesh that Paul had, but I, I tend to think that it was temptation that it was these thoughts that come in that are wrong. Because what I discovered is that there is a simple answer, not a complicated answer, to being in the presence of God. And it's not to have lots of strength of character or willpower, you know, or just being a really good person. That's not the answer. It's never been the answer. His grace is always the answer. The answer is hidden in the Lord's Prayer where it says, deliver us from evil. You know, when you pray that, he does? Every single time, no exceptions. He does it joyfully. He's excited about doing it. And I found that when I, when I take every single thought captive, as it says in 2 Corinthians, how did I take it captive? I said, here, Lord, take it and he'd crush it and then he'd smile and he'd say bring me another one and what I, I, I realized the secret that Paul found there my strength is perfected in your weakness sin doesn't have to drive me away from the presence of God it can drive me to the presence of God and I started realizing and applying that in my life and I found that I was never leaving. I was in his presence. And I was, I was never gone from his presence. In the course of this year, I have discovered a new life verse. My wife and uh, I have been um, uh, going through uh, a chronological Bible reading program and uh, having our devotions based upon that. And um, there is a, a verse in Genesis that just stunned me. It just hit me between the eyes. Now, my life verse uh, before was, was uh, Romans 1.16. 
I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation to every believer, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and, and goes on from there. That's always been a, a, a passion for me. I, I'm excited about evangelism. I work with Child Evangelism Fellowship, and I come here, and I got the website, and any chance I get, I want to share my faith. That was, that's a life verse. It's a good verse. Don't throw that one away, but I have a new one. It's Genesis 28, 16. Let's see if this will work here. Okay. Whoa. Holy mackerel, what's going on here? <laughs> okay, before I get to the, to the the actual life verse itself, I realize that all sin is a varied form of idolatry and all righteousness is a varied form of the great commandment to love him. And we tend to compartmentalize and we divide sin up in all these different categories, but really it is idolatry. And so what happens is that when, when you want to beat the sin and when it first enters your mind, your mind and you wanna take it captive, the first question is, who do you choose? Who's your God? Is the idol going to be your God or is God going to be your God? And so you choose him. And when you choose him every time, you know, he takes the thought captive and he, and he, and he beats it. Well, then as we were reading through, uh, through Genesis, I'm sure hoping this will... I think there's just a lag. I think that's the problem. Um, this passage is about Jacob. And Jacob um, has been uh, deceiving his father and all that. You remember the story. And uh, then he's going to get a wife. And so he's traveling north to the same place that Isaac uh, got his wife. And on the way there, he stops and he camps out in this little uh, place called Luz. L-U-Z, Luz. I think the people that lived there were probably called Losers. Anyway, he's in Luz. And he's, he's uh, camping out. We know he's camping out because it says he laid down to go to sleep and he put his head on a rock. So he used a rock for a pillow. And as he sleeps, he has this dream. And the dream is very familiar to most, even non-Christians. It's the Jacob's ladder dream. And he sees angels going up and down the ladder and, and uh, the Lord, uh, which would have been Jesus, standing at the top of the ladder. And and God reiterates the promises that he gave to Abraham and Isaac, and he gives them to Jacob again in this dream. Well, then, this is the verse that comes next. It says, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. But I plugged my own name in there. And it's like Mark woke up. And I said, the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I didn't even know it. This is the house of God. And that's truly what happened. And I burst out of the cocoon. And I was different because I realize now that I'm in the presence of the Most High God, the God who is outside the box, the God who spoke everything into existence, the God that entered into the box and redeemed me. He's here. It's not that he ever left. It's that I wasn't aware of it, but I woke up. So what I'm sharing with this, you this morning is not some technique or some willpower or anything like that all it is is just wake up there was a lady in our church who was talking about prayer and prayer was really related to this because she said you know when i want to get close to god and i'm having my quiet times and i i sit down and i put a chair over here and i just imagine that the lord is sitting in that chair when i'm talking to him and i and i looked over at her and i said you know what you don't have to pretend he is sitting in that chair. He's right there. If we can get a handle on that, the presence of God. And Jacob actually renamed the place. He called it Bethel, the house of God. 
So Luz was not a place for losers anymore. It was a place that was the house of God. Well, it, that made me think about a passage in Psalms that uh, um, David is talking about this, uh, uh, his love for being in the presence of God. He says, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. And I realized that the temple wasn't built yet. And I wondered if he was reflecting back to the house of God that Jacob had discovered because Jacob reflected back to Bethel again and again and again in his life. And that became the frame of reference for his life. And my prayer is that that would be the frame of reference for my life from, from now on, is that I'm not ever out of the presence of God, not ever. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians that we're to pray without ceasing. That means we're constantly with him. Now, I had trouble with that verse before because I thought, well, how do I think of enough things to say to where I could always be praying? It's not about thinking of things to say. You don't learn to pray by learning some oratory. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is being with him. It's just being with him. And if you have a thought, it's his. It's his thought. And uh, if you have uh, something to say, uh, you say it. But uh, if not, you just be in his presence. And that's what prayer is. It's not that prayer accomplishes things. It's that prayer is the great thing itself, being with him, that relationship. Paul talked about it. He said that everything is rubbish compared with knowing Christ Jesus, having that personal relationship with him. Now, I know that this stuff, is, I mean, it's it's old you've heard some of this before but do you really believe that what you believe is really real now what's happened to me is i don't have the highs and the lows now it's level and i'm just with him all the time just with him all the time just never leave him. now what happens if we go out on the streets that way you know it can be kind of intimidating if you're not with him but if you're with god when you go out on the streets huh What's the problem? If you're with him, I heard a sermon soon after this was happening to me on the story of Jesus in the, in the boat when the disciples hit the big storm and the waves came up and Jesus calmed the sea. He asked a question uh, at that time. Let's see if I have this one too. It says, he rose and rebuked the wind. He said, peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And I was hearing this sermon on this story, you know, familiar story. And then, then he said, well, what about this question that he, he asked? Why are you afraid? He's in the boat. He's asleep. He wakes up, calms the sea, says, peace be still. And he says, why are you afraid? And all of a sudden it hits me like a ton of bricks. The God of heaven and earth is in my boat. What is this? Why am I afraid? You know, I think if the disciples were asked that question, their first thought would be, why am I afraid? Let's see, there's a storm, duh. You know, what do you mean, why am I afraid? But the answer that, that they should have had is the God of heaven and earth is in my boat. And he is in our boat. I've had some texts back and forth with my sons who live in Chicago and, and uh, uh, telling them, you know, the God of heaven and earth is in your boat. My son told me about his, his new car, and I said, the heaven and, God of heaven and earth is in your car. You know, it's, if we get this idea that the God of heaven and earth is, is present with us, then it, change, it really changes the way we live. Um, I need to go back to this verse that was just up here a second ago. This is a sermon our pastor was preaching recently about, uh, he's going through John, and uh, here's where Jesus calls a couple of disciples. They're following along behind him, and he asks this question, what do you seek? And I have read this many times, and I just thought, you know, this is not really an important story. He, he calls them, what do you seek? And they you know, end up following him. But uh, uh, during this sermon, I, he, he raised the question, uh, well, what's the right answer to this question? And I'll put it to you. What's the right answer to this question? What do you seek? 
If Jesus asks you, what do you see? What, what are you after? What's your answer to the question? What's the right answer? And I would think that the disciples would try and imagine, well, what's something profound I could say, you know, to answer this question? And uh, we could think of different things that we might try to say, but how do you say anything that's going to impress Jesus, you know? What is it you seek? And uh, as our pastor was preaching, he said, I want to suggest something to you, that the disciples gave exactly the perfect answer to the question. What do you seek? You see, what they said was, I don't want just a quick answer. I don't want a one-liner. What do I seek? I seek you. Where are you staying? I don't want to just get an answer. I want to go be with you. And Jesus, I'm sure, broke into a big grin. And he says, come and see. And they went and they stayed with him. This is what our life needs to be like. We, are, we need to be with God all the time, never leaving. The only way that's going to be possible is if you take every thought captive. But you won't do that with your own willpower or your own efforts. What it, what it does, what, uh, the way that it's done is that you call on him. Deliver us from evil. You call on him. He takes the thought captive, and then you can stay if you don't take the thought captive, you can't stay in his presence. That's the enemy. That's what the enemy tries to bring in. So now what has happened is the devil shoots these thoughts, right? The, shoots the sin into our mind. We're supposed to be renewed, but he's trying to take over our mind. And instead of having a victory over us, we have the victory over him. And it turns out that, ever, that the more Satan attacks, the more I'm with God because I hold on to him even more. I tell children, you know, when I'm trying to explain about what it means to trust God, I give an illustration about when I was, when I was young, I was about seven years old, I think, and my dad and I were on a fishing trip. We were in Kings Canyon National Park and fishing on the Kings River, and there came a place where we had to cross the river to continue fishing, and so he said, well, the, the, the river levels out here, so you climb on my back, I'll take the fishing gear, and I'll wade across. It was about knee deep, and uh, so I did that, climbed up there. He says, don't, don't hold on to my neck, and hold on to my shoulders. <laughs> I always hold on to his neck. So we started across, and uh, there'd be these round, slippery rocks, and he'd stagger a little bit as he, as he hit those, and the, the river is really pretty forceful, even though it's calm, you know. So every time he staggered a little bit, I was scared. I'm seven years old, you know. But he's my dad, and I trust him. So when that happened, when he staggered a little bit, did I let go and say, I'm not trusting you anymore? No. That's when I held on tighter. And that's what my life is turning into now. It's every time the enemy attacks, that's just so much better because that just means I could just hold on tighter. This walk with God, I just, it changes everything, guys. And if you're walking with God sometimes and sometimes you're not, you know the truth, you've been saved, your sins have been forgiven, but the victorious life just isn't quite there, I just want to encourage you with this. It took me 37 years before I got to my 38th year when God really began to move in my life in the way that I really always wanted, and I just never quite had put the tapestry together. Um, now, I'm not here to tell you that I've arrived or that I'm now a great person. That's not what this is about, absolutely not. I'm the same sinful, weak person that I always was. What changed is that I'm with him, that's all. I woke up, he's doing it. In Galatians, Paul is talking to them and he says, you foolish Galatians who has bewitched you? You have, who began in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? We can't be perfected by the flesh. We're not gonna beat it by the, by the flesh with our own strength, with our own willpower, but we can call on him and then we can be with him and so every time can be a victory. And, and I'm telling you, I'm living life in total victory right now, but it isn't because I'm doing it. I can't, it's because he's doing it. So be with him and you never lose. Don't be with him and you lose, okay? That is gonna be tied now to what I wanna go into next about our witnessing and how we're sharing the gospel with people because I don't think there's any way we can lose when the God of heaven and earth is in our boat and when he's the one that's in control and not us. 
And we leave the outcome to him. We witness and then we leave the outcome to him. Um, let me see if I can advance here again. Okay, we have this yellow tract, and um, we've used this tract for years uh, with our Saints Alive group in our in our training here, and it's it's uh, not unlike uh, many of you and what you've been using dealing with the forgiveness of sins. Let's see, I think that that goes back into 1996. We've been using this since 1996. And it has served us pretty well. The idea of it is to talk about the forgiveness of sins. We approach Mormons talking about, well, what's the best blessing of being LDS? And then we say, well, you know, isn't it to dwell with Heavenly Father? So then do you know that you're forgiven so you can be there? And from there, we, we launch into the hopelessness of the impossible gospel. And Keith's giving you some teaching on that again this year, which I missed, but I'm sure it was the same basic idea. And... Uh, uh, it is, uh, it's tremendous. You, you need to show the Mormon that they're hopeless, that their gospel is impossible. And then the second part of this tract is the biblical gospel. And so the idea is that if you get, to a Mormon, get a Mormon to the point where they are hopeless and they realize that their gospel can't save them, then they'll be ready to ask you to share the biblical gospel. So that's the basic strategy. That's basically been the approach, has been to focus on the forgiveness of sins. That's not what we always did, though. I started coming in 93, and it, at that time, it was all about apologetics. It was all about um, arguing, debating. Uh, we'd bring lots of books with us and have all these references and, and quotes. And uh, I can remember Marshall going out there with his uh, Journal of Discourses with a beard like Brigham Young. And, uh, <laughs> um, and some, of, some people were, were uh, better versed than others, but those that came and didn't know anything about Mormonism uh, were real intimidated by that kind of witnessing because you just didn't know enough. You know, Mormonism is complex, and if you're going to witness that way, it's tough. But then we begin to discover that's not really what we're doing this for anyway. We're doing this because we want them to be forgiven. And so we changed. And I think we kind of all did it at the same time. And I think we kind of all discovered, although I, I think I should probably give credit to Tim Oliver because I believe he was, he was dealing with it very early on. Uh, he was using the miracle of forgiveness and whatnot. But I think really all of us began to see the same thing. A book came out um, called Speaking the Truth in Love to Mormons. And again, they were dealing with the forgiveness of sins as well in that book. Uh, Mark Kares wrote that, and that's a great, great book. Um, but it wasn't like one person really discovered this. I think we all were kind of realizing the forgiveness of sins is what it's all about. It says in Acts uh, 28, 26, 18, um, Jesus is telling Paul that your job is to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. And that was our mission. That's um, the, uh, you know, what, what's that book? The... Uh, purpose-driven life and the purpose-driven church, well, there's our purpose right there. The purpose is to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so they may receive the forgiveness of sins. And when I share with children in CEF, or if I share on the streets here, that's my purpose, is the forgiveness of sins is what I want for them. And I want to share with them to that end. And, and I'll just reiterate what you've been hearing from others. That's probably the single most important guarantee of success, as you, in, as you witness, is to keep your focus on that issue. If you have the forgiveness of sins, you have everything. Nothing is withheld from you. You're heir to all the treasures of heaven. If you don't, you have nothing. So why would it be any different with the Mormon? You want that for them. And if whatever rabbit trails you get off onto, and that's fine, that happens, but you always know where to bring it back to. We need to talk about the forgiveness of sins. That's what changes everything. So we, we went through a learning process and we be, began to deal with the forgiveness of sins more. This morning, I wanna to suggest to you that we need to alter our strategy just a little bit and still focus on the forgiveness of sins but take something else into account. And that's why I have given each one of you this, this new little booklet uh, about testimony. I just call this the te testimony booklet. Um, 
this uh, is kind of expensive to print when you print small quantities. This was done on a church copier with you know glossy paper and trimmed at Kinko's, and it's uh, it, I think it turned out pretty nice as far as the print quality. Um, but we could get the the cost of this down a lot if we could uh, uh, you know print larger quantities with a regular printer. But but I thought it was important for all of you to have this. As I worked on this during the year. I, I asked for input from a lot of you and uh, sent emails and whatnot. I know Chip responded and Sandra Tanner and uh, different people responded. And uh, pretty much everything that people suggested, uh, I incorporated into the, the booklet. But this was a passion that began more than 15 years ago. Um, I started writing a book uh, long ago and I already had my title for it. It was going to be called Epistle to My People. And the, the desire that I had was to write a book to Mormons that they would read and that I would share the gospel with them, I would share my story with them, and I would share with them how they could receive eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. And so I was going to call it Epistle to My People, and I actually started writing it. But about that time, what, it, what was that, 15, 20 years ago, when the web World Wide Web came to be, and I made a website, and all of a sudden I stopped working on the book because I was always doing witnessing through the through the internet. But I still had this in the back of my mind um, that I wanted to write a book and I wanted it to be directed to Mormons, that I wanted them to have everything they needed in their hand so they could get saved, even if it took them a long time to work through it. Well, I I, I guess I decided that a book is too much; that we need a booklet. And so that was the approach that I took as I went through it. But then I was thinking about what is the greatest roadblock to sharing with Mormons? What's the thing that makes it hardest to get across our message? And you've been hearing it. I mean, this has been the perfect setup with Andy sharing his story yesterday and talking about feelings. Um, and then um, Mitz sharing um, this morning, just wonderful testimonies, both of them, and um, it's 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 testimony, isn't it? It's their secret weapon. It's the thing that they hold up their sleeve. They're they're ready to pull it out. You know, it, you you go so far with the conversation, and you know sooner or later they're going to go. I have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and this is the restored church, and the Book of Mormon is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Isn't that true? Isn't that what happens? You know it's coming. Every time it's coming. Their testimonies are their ace in the hole. That is the thing that is their most prized possession. No matter what they read, I don't care how intelligent they are. They can be professors at BYU. They read all this stuff. In fact, I'm convinced that all the guys at, at Fair and Farms uh, know the truth intellectually. They've seen too much. They know there's a problem, but they hold this testimony. And they say, but I have a testimony. God has spoken to me. He's given me these feelings inside that tell me that the church is true. So it really doesn't matter what all the arguments are, what all the truth is, or, or the lies are. But my testimony is where it's at. That's how Mormons look at it. I think I have been vouched for by the last two testimonies you just heard. So how about if we deal with their testimony at the beginning instead of at the end? You know it's coming anyway. What if we tried a little bit different strategy and we started to do that? Now, this is just an idea, okay? What I'm suggesting is that you try it. I've been trying it the last couple nights. It's, it's new to me too. Um, but trying to deal with the testimony early on in the conversation. And I actually kind of steal it from them. I steal their thunder. I give their testimony for them. Uh, and I'm not completely sure yet whether that's better or whether it's better to ask them. But I think if you ask them to bear their testimony, you're going to get a really long spiel. Because typically Mormons tend to think that the more words they use, the stronger their point is. Uh, which, of course, is not the case, but they'll, they'll just take up all your time. So what I think is the best idea is to say, you have a testimony? Yeah. Well, I think a testimony is more valuable than gold if it's a real testimony. Um, can I guess what I think your testimony would include? I think your testimony would probably be something like, I know that the church is true, that the, it's been restored on the earth, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, 
that this is the one true church, that the Book of Mormon is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Would your testimony include those things, do you think? Am, am I right? And so far, every Mormon has said, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they do this every month. You guys that haven't been Mormons before, they have testimony meetings every month. And they, uh, they uh, suspend their regular meeting and they pass the microphone around and people stand up and they bear their testimony and they might give some little travelogue to go with it. But basically every single one of them says that same thing. I mean, you can say it for them. They, it's so, so common, what it, the words that they say. This is a brainwashing technique. They do it so many times. Da, 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 da. It's, it's like talking points. It's like you get to a certain point and it just comes out of them. They don't even think. They don't have to think. It's just automatic, autopilot. Uh, so we need to understand this when we're, when we're talking to them. It's not just a theological or a spiritual thing. It's a cultural thing. It's embedded in them. And so how about if we talk about testimonies at the beginning? Now, we as Christians have different lingo. We talk about witnessing. You know, I'm going to go out and witness. And uh, what do we say when we witness? Well, we talk about what God has done for us, right? And we share the gospel. Isn't that the same thing as these words? I have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the words they use. So let's use their words. A testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Say so. Tell them, I have a, a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my testimony is different because it holds up. If, if a witness goes into court and they have to give testimony, then they're, they're uh, cross-examined and the attorney will bring in things to try and undermine that testimony and show that that testimony um, it couldn't be uh, valid or authentic because there's contradictions. And there's an example in this little booklet about Henry. Henry's a hypothetical guy who says, I saw somebody uh, shoot the victim at, uh, in the park at three o'clock on July 13th. And so he testifies to this on the stand. And then the attorney comes in and says, hmm, well then how come I have this ATM record that you were completely on the other side of town at that time and you made a transaction, your PIN number is recorded, and there's even surveillance video and there you are. He could show it to the jury. There's this picture of Henry at that time. Ouch, you know, that means his testimony doesn't hold up. And Henry could be completely honest he could be completely sincere. It's just that he didn't remember it right. He's, he's, um, he doesn't know what he thinks he knows. So what we're gonna do is we share with the Mormons to help them understand that there's holes in their testimony. They don't really know what they think they know. They're sincere. Uh, you know, they're not trying to fool anybody, but it's just come from all those times in the testimony meetings. It's not that they really do know it. So we start asking some questions from there. Now, in this booklet, I have seven examples of holes in their testimony. I'm sure you could find more, but I'm, I'm focusing in, in the booklet on their testimony in particular. I'm not trying to do apologetics. I intentionally avoided that. I know, Chip, you had suggested something in the, in the section about the Book of Mormon to, to talk about some of the arguments. And I, I do have a little bit of that in there, but I didn't want to turn it into a, a debate kind of a thing but rather talk about it in terms of their testimony, their claim. So here's one of the most powerful ones that, um, that I used. I, it was not last night, the night before, is the very first hole in your testimony. Now, let me see if I can illustrate this. Oh. <laughs> There's my three reasons to witness. I'm going to skip over this part. You've, you've heard this before from me, but there's three reasons to witness to Mormons. Love, love, and love. Okay, I bear you my testimony now. Okay, we've already basically talked about that. Their secret weapon. Uh, 
Oh, this was supposed to come at the end. Okay, I'm going to skip over this part. <laughs> Contradictions. <laughs> okay, this is what I want to show you. This is the first testimony hole. I asked the Mormon, you know, you have a testimony. I'm not going to argue with you making that statement. I'm sure you, you uh, believe that you have a testimony. But that testimony is about someone, isn't it? You have a testimony of who, exactly? Your testimony involves the commandments, and you believe you should keep God's commandments. So who is he? Who is this God that you have a testimony about? Now, I put this up here with a picture of the first vision story, and I think when you juxtapose the, what the Bible says against this first vision, it's, it's kind of striking. The, the problem here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and might. That is a little bit contradictory when you look at the picture that they have there. That's their picture. They have two gods that they mostly deal with. And they have the Holy Ghost, okay, would be a third one, but they're different gods. They're distinct, separate gods. Theologically, in their own mind, Mormons often just gloss over this. They don't even think about it. Oh, yes, it's the commandment. Yes, oh, yes. I know what the first commandment is, to love God. But nobody has ever stopped to ask them, which one? Who do you love? Now, this is not a trick question. This is not something that, you, in fact, I tell Mormons that. I'm not saying this just to try and trap you or something. This is really important stuff. Because who it is that you're worshiping and honoring and praying to, that is really, really important. It's what your testimony is all about, is this one being. Your first love, as it says in the book of Revelation. Who is your first love? And you ask that question knowing that he's having this vision with, with two of them standing there. Which one? They're confused. Um, I don't know if you guys listen to Glenn Beck at all. Glenn Beck, Mormon, you know, he is a Mormon. And lately he's been saying, we need to return to God. Our country needs to return to God. Well, c couldn't get any argument from me about that. But the first thing I ask is, which one, Mr. Glenn Beck? You believe in more than one. And we ought to be asking Mormons, whenever they raise this, uh, mention the word God or Lord, we ought to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just, I just want to be clear here. Which one? What do you, which one are you talking about? The first and greatest commandment applies to one of them. Which one is it? Um, How about this one? That thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt uh, not bow down thyselves to them. For I am a jealous God. Which one is jealous? One of them is jealous. Is it Elohim or is it Jehovah? Is it the Father or is it the Son? This is a really good question, isn't it? This word jealous, it makes it really personal. Uh, in fact, uh, he says that his name is Jealous. Name is Jealous, Elkanah. His name is Jealous. This is not a minor point in the Bible. This is a, a point of major emphasis. Now, if there's only one God and he's Jealous, that's not a sin because all he's asking for is reality from us. He's, he's asking for us to worship the one who is due worship you know he's asking for what is his but if there's multiple gods if there's a plurality of gods as joseph smith said then this is a real this is a real problem because any any of these gods who are jealous it's a sin so they now have sinful gods if they're jealous how about isaiah 43:10 you guys have used this one before right Understand, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, beside me there is no Savior. Which one is that? The one that has no God before him. Well, if it's Jesus, it's a little contradictory because he did have a God before him, right? Actually, if it's the Father, there's still a problem because he had a God before him too. And I'll mention the, the term uh, Heavenly Grandfather. Um, they never talk about Heavenly Grandfather. They usually just kind of laugh. They don't get offended by that, by the way. 
do you say heavenly grand, is it heavenly grandfather? They'll usually just smile or laugh or something because they know their doctrine actually calls for a heavenly grandfather. If God was once a man and he progressed to become God, then there would have had to have been a heavenly grandfather, which of course means there was a great grandfather and you know, it just goes endlessly. So when the Bible says that his name is the most high, El Elyon, who's the most high? Again, it's this question of who is it that we serve? You have a testimony, but it's, it's got to be a testimony of somebody. Is there a God beside me? There is no God I know, not any. So who's your testimony of? Now, this is really, it's really puzzling. A lot of times they will, they will immediately reply, reply with an answer. Like um, this fellow last night said, uh, well, it would be the F Heavenly Father. It would be Elohim, and I always kind of use those words, Elohim or Jehovah, the Father or the Son, and he says it would be, it would be Elohim. I said, well, then who did, who did Moses pray to? Remember Moses, he, uh, he, he had uh, a, a vision at the burning bush, and then he had the Ten Commandments given to him. Who gave him the Ten Commandments? Doesn't the church teach that, that Jehovah is the God of the Old Testament? So wasn't that Jesus that was giving Moses the Ten Commandments and saying, I am a jealous God? And then he starts looking at me like this, and like, oh, I never really thought about that. See, and Mormons really, they very rarely have thought about this. So you're challenging their testimony, asking them about who it is that their testimony is about, and you're getting them to think about something that is very, very profound. Now, you, you put this in contrast with what I was just sharing with you a minute ago about, about us, about my walk, about the God that I worship, the God who is outside the box, the God who's the creator of everything, who created it ex nihilo, from nothing. He didn't just organize it like Jesus did under the direction of Heavenly Father, as their doctrine calls for. My God is so different from their gods. And so when you talk about who is your testimony about, it's not just a trick question, it's not a peripheral issue. This is right at the heart of the matter. And if you don't talk about testimony early on, you're gonna get nailed with it later, so why not bring this up early on? Okay. Um, there are other testimony holes uh, in the booklet goes into it. The second one has to do with whether they even understand what their own gospel is. Their own gospel is the impossible gospel. It is um, put into my nutshell statement, and I've got these, these tracks here, which talk about the nutshell statement. In Mormonism, to be forgiven of a sin by the atonement, you must successfully stop that sin permanently. To be forgiven of all sin, you must su successfully stop all sin permanently. That's the impossible gospel in a nutshell. It is hopeless. And, if you ask a Mormon about, well, what is the gospel? It's very common for them to be totally confused and they don't know. Now, some of them do understand because it is in their scripture. Um, and I think one of the strongest ones I have in the booklet is uh, from DNC 1, uh, 31 and 32. For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. And you add to that DNC 80, Two, uh, two seven that says that if you sin, your former sins return upon you. Those two together really make up the nutshell statement. So that is their gospel, but it is amazing how many of them don't know that. They don't know what their gospel is. So that can be one of the holes in their gospel. That may not always be because they may understand it. But the follow-up to it, even if they do understand it, is hole number three. If you get to that part, the third big hole in their testimony is, are you doing it? Now this is really important too because they, they swear they have a testimony, they know that it's true, but are you following it? Well, no. What kind of testimony is that? They don't do what they know they're supposed to do. Well, nobody's perfect. Yeah, but your gospel says to be perfect. You know, my gospel doesn't say that I have to stop all my sin to be forgiven. My gospel says that I'm forgiven of my sin when I simply receive it as a gift by faith. I do receive it as a gift by faith. I do what my gospel says to do. Okay? No, I'm not perfect, but my gospel, the law is not my gospel. That's the bad news, okay? The good news is grace. Okay, now there is quite a bit in that section on that whole. It's pretty much what is in the yellow tract. If you really like using the yellow tract, like Jim, I know you like using the yellow tract. 
Um, well, it's all there. It's all in the third hole, so you can talk about um, all those different scriptures. Um, it, it basically uh, uh, talks about how difficult it is to do, and then there's common objections. And, uh, you know, oh, but I know that if I try my best, then he will forgive the rest. Eh, wrong. This is absolutely not a teaching of the church. You've just demonstrated you do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, you cannot possibly have a testimony of it. So there's some objections you can go through that are, you've all heard these on the street, and maybe you will be able to add more to this list, uh, and we can, we can put that into the, uh, the next edition of it. But I'll let you thumb through all that. I don't, we don't have the time to go through all those. Now, um, I gotta wrap up, sorry. <laughs> we'll try and draw this to a quick close. The fourth testimony hole um, is about um, what is it exactly that you're saying is true? And this is in reference to their scripture, in particular, the Book of Mormon. They say, I know that the Book of Mormon is true. Um, well, the first question I have is, what did the Book of Mormon prophets say about the Book of Mormon? And here's on page uh, 15, there's a bunch of scriptures there from the Book of Mormon where uh, Book of Mormon prophets said that it's an imperfect record and that they have weakness in their writing. And so then my question is, well, if they didn't have a testimony of the Book of Mormon being reliable, how could you? You know, you're telling me you know that it's true. The thing is, Mormons don't really have a very strong testimony when it comes to the Book of Mormon. They'll say they know it's true, but you know, it can still have mistakes in it, still can be imperfect. And uh, my testimony of the Bible is that the Bible in the Greek and Hebrew, the original Greek and Hebrew is inerrant, inerrant. Their, their testimony of the Book of Mormon doesn't come close to that. They do not believe the Book of Mormon is inerrant. So they have a weak testimony compared to mine. So, and that's one thing you want to kind of do is talk about how awesome your testimony is and how it holds up and how their testimony is just based on feelings and it doesn't hold up when you start cross-examining the witness. Um, and then the, the main point about the Book of Mormon is that there's lots of different ones. The 1830 version is very different from the one today, and there were different ones along the way. Now, the people who lived during the time of each of those Book of Mormons said they have a testimony that it's true. Well, which, which group was wrong? Wh or which, which groups were wrong? Was the 1830 version right, or is the current version right? And typically, they're, they're assuming that the latest version is going to be better because they keep correcting the problems. But see, what, the, what it means is that they are pursuing the revision, and we are pursuing the original. When we dig into our Bibles, we want to know what God actually said in the original autographs. And so we do research with manuscripts, and there's thousands of manuscripts backing up the Bible. There's zero for the Book of Mormon. They have nowhere to go. They can't go to the original autographs. They don't even want to. They want to go to the revision anyway because they have a living prophet. And so their testimony is weak. They like the revisions, we want the original from God himself. Um, so the question is, which Book of Mormon do you have a testimony of? Are you sure which one it is? Even more profound would be the Doctrine and Covenants because there's even more changes there. The um, lectures on faith are completely gone. So did the saints who had a testimony of the lectures on faith, were they being deceived by the devil? You know, I mean, it's, and I'm, again, I put this in terms of the, testimony they say they have. Um, fifth, fifth testimony whole is prophecy. They say they have a living prophet. The only problem is their living prophet doesn't prophesy. And I'll ask them to na name a prophecy. And sometimes they will say, well, um, everything he says in conference is, is prophecy. I say, wait a minute. <laughs> They, the church does not really believe that because what about uh, when, uh, when Brigham Young taught that Adam was God? Do you buy that? No, the church doesn't buy that now. So why is this any different? I just had on my shirt, the, what, two nights ago, a quote from Wilfred Woodruff where at the temple dedication for the Manti temple, he said man, that, that uh, plural marriage would continue until the coming of the Son of Man. That was a prophecy. Did that come true? That was in 1888. Two years later, the manifesto completely reversed that. So 
Is he a living prophet? Was he a living prophet for the Mormons living at that time? It's a little bit of a problem. What about uh, Hinckley and, and th now Thomas Monson? Where's the prophecies? Is there any prophecy that they've given? No. So they have a living prophet. I'll do like Keith does. Let me get this straight. <laughs> you have a living prophet who doesn't give prophecies. Hmm. Hey, I'm a living prophet too. Because I don't give prophecies either. I know that's mocking, but I think in certain cases there's a place for it. Remember uh, uh, the, uh, the mocking of the prophets of Baal? You know, I think there's a, there's a place where you can, you can do it, you know, kind of gently and, and make your point. You know, a living prophet should mean something. And you have a so-called living prophet that's, well, he's living. I, I guess I agree with that part of it, but that's about as far as I can go with it. Okay, the uh, sixth testimony hole is interpretation. This is a big deal. This is what um, was being discussed by Andy yesterday. How do you interpret what you're feeling? If feeling is what's going to determine whether something's true or not, how do you even know exactly how to interpret it? And how do you know where it's coming from? And Andy was, was demonstrating the, the real problem that they don't really know where it's coming from. They assume where it's coming from just because it feels good or just because there's a, a sign or a wonder attached to it that somehow is miraculous. And he gave an example of that where um, this so, supposedly second wife uh, had known his uh, secret name from the temple. So there could be signs and wonders attached to it. We don't deny that. Satan is very powerful. Uh, it says, if possible, he would deceive even the very elect when it comes to false messiahs. But uh, that is not the determination of truth. You want to, of course, use Jeremiah 17, 9. Last night when I was sharing uh, with the, uh, the gal, Hailey, that you were talking to earlier, she came over and we continued that conversation. And I quoted Jeremiah 17, 9. She says, you know, how can you argue with this feeling I have? I says, well, the Bible says in, in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And you should have seen the look on her face. It was like, what? It was total shock. It was a completely foreign concept to her that her heart could be misleading her. Mormons assume that that's, there's no way that could be. They're told to follow their heart. Like it says, you've seen that movie Fireproof? He's told, you're not supposed to follow your heart. You're supposed to lead your heart. <laughs> uh, I'm very emotional, but it comes after what God works in my life. It's not the determiner of truth. That's just not how truth is determined. But that chapter deals with that whole thing. And the fact that you get a feeling, it comes to you in some kind of code. You have to decode it. I mean, just a feeling alone doesn't transmit a detailed message. So if you get a detailed message, then you've got to say, well, how do I interpret that? And I got a little guy uh, with semaphore there sending code. But you you have to go to feeling language school before you can properly interpret what the feelings mean. And of course, they haven't done that. So I mean, you're just trying to help them see that their testimony has holes. You know, you're, you're not trying to slam them personally, but that they don't really know what they have been assuming that they know. The, the last testimony hole in the booklet, at least, is the fact that there's a lot of competition. Often this might be the best one to bring up first uh, because there are lots of testimonies out there. You can point to the fact, hey, you know, there's over a billion Muslims who have a testimony. They say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's their testimony. Why is their testimony not valid? Well, you would agree that it's not valid. Actually, some of the Mormons waffle on that. But normally, a Mormon would say, yeah, well, that's not valid. Well, there's over a billion of them. How many Mormons are there? You know, you're a little outnumbered there. The thing is, it matters whether the testimony holds up. It matters whether it's validated or not. I'm suggesting that if you will examine my testimony, it will hold up, it will be validated. Your testimony does not hold up. Um, so anyway, this is a strategy. Now, I'm not suggesting that the way that you should start witnessing now is to go through this book or go through everything in this book. I'm suggesting that you can use some of the ideas in this book as you witness and that you keep in your mind the idea that a testimony is something that is going to be a big roadblock 
and you're going to have to deal with it. And if you think you're going to share the gospel with them and you're going to dodge that one, you're fooling yourself. You're not. You're going to have to face up to the, the fact that they have a testimony. So why not prepare? The scripture says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you. That means you're supposed to get ready. You're supposed to get prepared. So that's what the uh, intent of this is all about. Now, I um, want to ask for you to give me all the input that I can from you as you experiment with this on the streets. And I want to continue to do modifications on it and polish it up. Um, I have uh, an acknowledgement section in the back. I've already talked to lots of different people about their ideas. I've tried to pull the best ideas that I hear every time I come, but I'm always hearing new stuff and I want to hear more so we can put it in here. I want this to be something that we do together. It's not just me putting this together. I want it to be an effort from, from all the Christians that love Mormon people and want to want to see them get saved. So if you would join me in that effort, I would really appreciate it. Um, as we do that. Now, printing this thing costs two bucks a pop. Um, I wanted you all to have one, and whether or not you can make a contribution to the fund, I don't care. Um, but it will take about $2,500 to 3000 in order to print enough to get the price down below 50 cents. I think we've got to get it that cheap before we can really start distributing them. So I guess I will put it out to you that if you or people that you know you think would be willing to, to contribute to a fund to raise $3,000 to have a first printing of a revised testimony booklet, this booklet is, is complete, or at least I want it to be complete, so that if you put this into the hands of a Mormon, they have everything they need to get saved. It has the scripture references, it has the explanation of the gospel at the end that's, that's very clear, tells them exactly what, how they need to respond if they want to receive the forgiveness of sins. Everything's in here. Mostly when we, when we hand out tracts, there's no way we could get it all in. With a booklet, you can if you can get them to read it. So if you think you have a Mormon who will read it and you ask them if they will read it, give them a booklet. I don't care if it costs 10 bucks. <laughs> give them a booklet. Um, I don't know how many of we have left, but we'll go with whatever we have tonight and tomorrow night. Um, but I wouldn't distribute these willy-nilly. I mean, I, you want to give it to them if you think they're going to read it. So, uh, so those are some, some ideas. Um, I guess I'm just going to wrap up with this. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? Is the Most High God your God? Or are there idols in the way? If there are, it's not a one-time choice, by the way. It's not, yes, I choose God and now I've finished my decision, it's all over. Every time an alternative is slung at you by the enemy, you have to make that choice again. You have to say, I choose you, Lord. 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 You're first. You're number one. You're all I want. All things are of you and through you and to you. I worship you not just in my quiet times. I worship you in my noisy times. I worship you in my hectic times. I worship you when things seem like they're not going my way because I have your promise that they are going my way. Lord God, we commit to you the gospel that you've entrusted to us so that we can share it, not as ones just giving out information, but as your loved ones who are introducing a wonderful, awesome God to our beloved Mormon friends. Not just a methodology, but a person that we know personally. That's my, my prayer for myself and for all of us here. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
But when, when we, especially when we communicate that we love them, they just don't have process. Oh. So keep that in mind. Yes. And I and I would I would hold to the belief that those who are the most intense at reaching these people for the Lord love them the most. Man, we see what's going on and we just it just breaks our hearts to know where they're headed and to know what's going on and those of us that live here and reach out and are I am accused of being way too intense. It's just because I just way too intensely love them. That's why. So uh, let's close with a word of prayer and then we will be dismissed and we'll see you on the streets at six o'clock. And let's try to get started right at six. Try to get there 15 minutes early so we can get started at six and give ourselves as much time as possible 